Flat Earth Clues, Part 10, Hiding God. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. As you can tell from the title, I'm taking a different approach. Eventually, I was going to have to address the question of what happens next or what we do now with the information at hand. If you've made it through the guide and the first nine clues, then at this point you're either buying into the flat model or on the fence. If this is the first one you went to because of the title, I recommend you go back because we're not going to do much in the way of reviewing. But if you're still with me, then you would agree that one, the world you've been taught has been kept from you, and two, one way or another, you would like to prove this out. So how is this possible? The authority in question who created what you call the globe is guarding all the gates. They protect the sky, the outer edge, and most importantly, the education system that shows us at an early age what they want us to see. Nobody listening to this has their own spaceship or advanced rocket program. Nobody actually owns a long-distance icebreaker. And while some of you may have a private plane, I wouldn't recommend testing a military barrier that technically doesn't exist. But then again, you have to remember that this is not the story of David and Goliath. The hidden world was never going to be sustainable forever. As a civilization evolves, the tools the authority uses as a method of control become more vulnerable. I've learned many things about systems over the years, and one thing that I find most interesting is as layers of strength increase, the higher the chance that they can be used to your advantage. But maybe I'm talking in riddles. I should be boiling it down to what can be done by showing you what's being hidden, what's important, and how it can be spread to others without looking like a crazy person. To be clear, and I can't stress this enough, do not start conversations with the word flat earth. Think of it like fight club. The first rule of flat club is that you do not talk about flat club. Before you started waking up and watching all these things, you were like me. You laughed and mocked everything that was flat earth. You may have learned faster than others, but the knee-jerk reaction by 99% of the people was created the day they sat down in a classroom and stared at the globe. Look at the videos, not just mine, but others who are putting forward some great arguments, and ask the questions that people can relate to. I'm going to introduce three very important questions that you can use each with a statement that precedes it, and each statement is a motivation for a different group of people. If you don't fall into one of these three groups, then I guarantee you know people that do. The first statement is this, you are being hidden. What do I mean by that? Well, this goes back to clue seven and clue nine, which talk about the flights in the Southern Hemisphere. If you are flying a plane over the Southern Hemisphere, your flight is not being tracked. How can this be used to find out the truth? It's simple, it's quick, and it costs no money. No matter what country you live in, send a quick note to your local, state, or federal representative and ask them this question. Why are citizens of our country flying over oceans without the safety net of the GPS system? And remind them that GPS stands for global, not partial. Without GPS, Anything could happen to your plane, and no one knows where you are. And while you're at it, remind them that the GPS system was built by the United States Department of Defense, who never does anything small. The system that is in effect now has what appears to be huge, deliberate gaps in the Southern Hemisphere only. Do not mention Flat Earth. Just voice your concern about the safety of you, your loved ones, and your fellow citizens. Will they get back to you? Possibly. 
Will they give you a satisfactory answer? Not a chance. Because they will only have what the military gives them. What this will do, however, is create a unique buzz in certain circles that may prove to be useful later. The more politicians or high-ranking officials you contact, the greater the noise. The motivation here, as you can tell, is general public concern. The second statement is this. Wealth is being hidden. What do I mean by that? Goes back to clue two and every other mention regarding Antarctica. In 1954, it was announced on national television that the continent was just millions of miles of rich energy resources. And by 1959, it was sealed off like Area 51. How can this be used to find out the truth? By contacting anyone you know in either the petroleum, natural gas, or mineral industry. This means ExxonMobil, British Petroleum, Royal Dutch Shell, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, BHP Billiton, Rio Tinto, Glencore, Anglo-American, and there are many others. Find anyone in these companies and make inquiries about their prospects in Antarctica. Send them the link to the Admiral Byrd interview and ask them why, if there are no environmental conflicts regarding oil, gas, or mining, why aren't they allowed to even petition the idea, even when the world's energy resources are dwindling more every day? Put the sound of money in their ear. They may not be able to break through the decades of red tape laid out in front of them, but it will create a buzz from a different side, the motivation of greed, and of pristine resources just begging to be harvested. And finally, to preface the third statement, I need to thank all the people who have sent me stacks and stacks of biblical scripture asking me to stop dancing around the title of the flat model and call the structure what it really is. And you know, they have a point. I have put myself at a distance because I want to reach people who are outside of religious faith and even outside of general conspiracies. But for all those spiritual groups who have contacted me, I can now, however, say with conviction that this third statement is this. They are hiding God. Despite what labels I put on the flat model structure, the oldest names are from the oldest texts, one of those being called the firmament. If the firmament was indeed discovered in 1956 and it was deliberately hidden, then the ruling authority not only hid the structure, but evidence of the builders, and by builders I mean creators, and by that I mean what people define as God. Hiding God could be considered one of the worst ideas of all time, and if you are a person of great or small faith, you have a vested interest in any evidence that would solidify and vindicate your years of dedicated service. If a structure was found that had, for all intents and purposes, the handprint of God on it, then the ruling authority has no right to keep it from you. There are billions of people on this world who have personally dealt with the concept of God and would like to know for sure if these beliefs are well placed. Or, in short, you want to know the meaning of life. It's out there. And it's been hidden from you. Your motivation is clear. Go to your church leaders, your congregation, and tell them science probably found evidence of God in 1956 and decided to keep it a secret. If you know people of religious power, send this up the ladder. Get the word out and see what comes back. Between these three statements and questions, people will talk to people who will talk with others and eventually reach someone who knows. This isn't a grassroot or groundswell movement that takes a long time, because the system that has been used to mold and control you these past years has been based on speed, and by that I mean real time. All it takes is a single video. 
a memorandum, one whistleblower, one key person, and everything changes, not in months or weeks or days, but hours. And in those hours, everything changes because of the speed. People all over the world wake up and look at the sky with new eyes, and things start to get better. One person. That's all it takes. One person to come forward and share what has been hidden for so long. Maybe someone who is tired of all the games. Maybe someone who has gone year after year burdened by such a heavy secret. Maybe you, who are listening right now, who is looking for a reason to come forward. This is it. And if you don't want to walk into the light and be the hero, I understand. But if you can't, for whatever reason, then be anonymous. Share the message and help us make this world better because it can be better. For everyone else, give this person an opening. Give them the opportunity and give them the support they need to help reclaim what's left of our civilization because we need it now more than ever. I will keep spreading the word for as long as I can, in hopes that everyone that hears it starts seeing things with new eyes. And I encourage each of you to do the same. And maybe one day, we will learn to treat others better than we treat ourselves. Flat Earth Clues, Part 11, Souls in the System. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the Flat Earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue looks into the recent past, or more specifically, an odd but interesting piece of conspiracy lore. What I hope to show here is an example of how an enclosed system once revealed, can change the world very quickly and in ways you may not have realized. To start, we need to go back a little ways to a controversial 2004 documentary called Astronauts Gone Wild. For those of you who missed this strange little gem, the summary is this. The producer-director Bart Winfield Sibrel went out to prove that all the moon landings were elaborate hoaxes. To do this, he set up interviews with the Apollo astronauts, giving them the impression that the interview was just routine. He then produced a Bible and asked each of the astronauts to swear on the book before the interview started. The interview was then supposed to be a series of detailed technical questions designed to trip up the astronauts. During the process, there was quite a bit of tension and some very uncomfortable moments, including one actual fist fight. Now, I'm not recommending that anyone actually go out and watch this hour-long documentary. For me, the astronauts have had to live with this guilt a long time, and leaving them alone seems like the humane thing to do. What interested me, and moreover what piqued my interest then, wasn't the unoriginal questions the reporter posed, but how the astronauts reacted to the Bible itself. None of the Apollo pilots would put their hand on it and swear that they went to the moon. In fact, most treated the book like it was made of plutonium. This puzzled me for years, because it went against the basic rules of any cover-up, one of which is lie about everything. Now, the pilots of the Apollo program had done many interviews over the years, many televised, and had been going through their song and dance without really any instances of contention. So why not just go through the motions again? It is, after all, just a book, right? People lie under oath all the time. It's called perjury. And every country has an extensive system of laws and punishments to deal with it. These punishments don't seem to stop the people from committing perjury, and you can read about it almost every day. Furthermore, 
the astronauts were not in court. This was just a room, sometimes their own home. So swearing on the book f would, for all intents and purposes, be meaningless. And this sat in the back of my head for years because it didn't make sense. Why would astronauts, trained by a very large military science program, be afraid of just putting their hand on the book and just tell one more lie? Well, for them, it may have been more than just a book. It may have been a symbol of something much bigger. You see, for you, me, and almost everyone else, a holy book is a symbol of faith, because the creator or creators have yet to be revealed. But if you knew that the creators were real, then the book becomes something much more tangible, more relevant, more sobering. Or, more to the point, the Apollo astronauts would have been let in on the enclosed system during their tenure with NASA, and over the decades, this system created certain truths for these men, one of which is, someone could be watching. Now, whether the builders slash creators are actually watching every little thing we do can be debated, but if you have proof that they are real, then the thought of your every move being scrutinized is a very real possibility. This is what you and I may suspect, but don't feel. The Apollo pilots, however, are a different story. If they were shown how the world really looked, then their attitude towards the book takes on a whole new meaning. In fact, it didn't have to even be a Bible. It could have been an encyclopedia or a piece of wood because it was the idea that made them pause. And if you're still not getting it, then I'll ask you directly. If you actually saw some of the Creator's handiwork and knew that there was a chance you were being watched, and there was a scorecard involved, would you swear against that and lie about something? Would you roll those dice and take the chance? Or to put it another way, Everyone has gotten frustrated about something, then looked up and cursed the sky. Would you still do that if you knew that a creator was up there and possibly listening? That's just one example of how knowledge of the enclosed system changes people. The astronauts didn't want to roll the dice and lie because there was a real fear of retribution. And while they were confident that a bolt of lightning wasn't going to strike them down, they also weren't going to push their luck. And we all take on the same approach in daily life. Everyone who drives has run a stoplight. We know when we see the yellow light that it's too far away, so we hit the gas and hope for the best, especially if the traffic is light and we aren't putting anyone in danger. But you take that very same intersection and put a red light camera on it, well, then things change, don't they? Do you hit the gas and roll the dice? Not a chance. You hit the brakes and hope that you can stop in time because you are being watched. You may not be a model driver by any sense of the word, but you understand this rule and this place and you don't break it. And this one aspect is why I'm pushing so hard to see the enclosed system revealed. Because as a civilization, we seem to be only as good as what we can get away with. This isn't an issue with freedom, it's an issue with doing the right thing. You know that running red lights is a bad idea. The camera is a reminder of that. Imagine all the things that would change for the better if the enclosed system was revealed. Would you lie to hurt someone? Would you rob a bank, commit fraud? or embezzle? Would you steal anything unless your life depended on it? And while people would still get angry and fight, would they maim each other? Would they kill? Would anyone knowingly commit murder? Would you bully or extort people for profit? In fact, knowing that the world was created, would you do anything malicious towards anyone? 
If the world is not a globe, but instead enclosed, then wars end. Hate crimes end. Maybe not overnight, but quickly. Because you may be, for the first time in your life, actually accountable for your actions. You realize now that you are a very real soul in this enclosed system, and you have a responsibility towards your fellow man, one that can be boiled down into one simple rule. Treat others better than you treat yourself. This, this is why it's so important to show the world as it really is. This is why I am asking the authority itself to open the door and let this secret come through. You've kept this hidden for too long, and the people who live here with you have been through enough. This isn't about money or power anymore. It's about our very souls, the essence of who we are. Wealth and titles don't define your heart. Hiding the entire world may have seemed like a good idea at the time, but we have gone way beyond that. Have you actually seen our home recently? This needs to be fixed, and it needs to be now. The people won't forget the deception, but they will forgive you for it, because a truth like this will make them more noble, something we should have been since the beginning. So do your own research, and always, always ask questions, because that's the only way you will find all forms of the truth. Feel free to email me at msargent23 at comcast.net or 303-494-6631. Finanziell helfen kann. 
y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und Motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im Moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my fir the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, e explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgenden. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. Bitcoin adressen in Papier ausdrucken, um, minimum 10 or besser gleich 100. Y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero, And the next time uh, you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas. And for your friends, of course. Und für deine Freunde natürlich. O tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante. O maybe a tip in a restaurant. Oder trinkgeld im restaurant. Bueno, a la hora de imprimir también copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin. De direcciones de Bitcoin. 
when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin Adressen druckt, auch die äh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Address Schlüsseln ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de abril 2015, escribir la fecha, más plus cuatro años, eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015, plus, plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin eh, en estos cuatro años, yo lo vuelvo a tener, tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in this um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Um, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Schlüssel. Wenn du bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. This way you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. In mein Video antigo. In the ancient Jewish temple, a large veil blocked access to the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God dwelled. It was a constant reminder that sin separated us from God. Nobody was allowed in except for the high priest, and then only once a year. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would pass through the veil to offer a sacrifice for the sins of Israel. This continued for generations, because the sacrifice could never be good enough. Fortunately, it was just a foreshadowing of what was to come. Two thousand years ago, something changed. A new sacrifice was offered. A perfect sacrifice. One final sacrifice for all of time. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. He paid the ultimate price so that the sins of all men could be forgiven. At the moment of his death, the large veil in the temple, the very thing that represented centuries of separation from God, was torn. Torn in two from the top down, 
showing that this era of separation was over. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the Holy of Holies once and for all time and secured our redemption forever. We read in the book of Exodus that um, the temple had a veil, was to have a veil, a cloth curtain, uh, separating the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, uh, from the, the rest of the holy place. There are sections within the temple building itself that are more holy than others, where access is restricted more than other places. And the most holy place where only the high priest can go once a year uh, is separated from the rest by this curtain. This, I would imagine it would be fairly substantial uh, in order to, to give the sanctity and the aura of holiness behind it. In the temple, the priest would offer sacrifices in the holy place. But once a year, he would bring a sacrifice beyond a, a thick veil uh, a curtain, and that would go into the Holy of Holies, and there he would offer the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement sacrifice. And that sacrifice, which is almost, in my opinion, when we get a credit card, it's like paying the minimum uh, and not really dealing with the debt, but paying the minimum and paying the minimum. And when the Messiah came and when he died, his sacrifice, though outside the gate of the city, actually is the final sacrifice for sin. It is the one that all these interim Yom Kippur sacrifices were leading up to. They were pointing to this one that was coming. And now this one, not the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of God's Son, the Messiah himself, as he dies, that veil, that thick veil is torn in half to say that no other sacrifices need be offered here. The final payment has come it's been taken care of. And so the, the tearing of the veil indicates the permanence, the, the final sacrifice of the Messiah Jesus. In the Old Testament, God chose to dwell among his people in the temple. And if a holy God is going to dwell amongst unholy people, there has to be some way to protect his holiness from the unholiness of Israel. So he had this elaborate scheme of who could enter his presence behind a veil. No one could go past here. Only the most sacred of priests who had fully cleansed themselves once a year would go into the Holy of Holies. So in a sense, the people knew he was there but had no accessibility to him. God, I believe, when he ripped that veil, I can just imagine those almighty hands whoom, ripping that veil. What he did is he said, come on in. You're welcome. You don't have to stay out there anymore. You can come in and you don't have to be perfect to come into my holy place because Jesus has made a way for you. I love the word access in the Bible. Uh, maybe it's because I'm in a wheelchair, I don't know, but I, I love when the Bible speaks about God's love being accessible. And right there, you've got such a vivid physical symbol of the access, the doors thrown open wide to the throne of God. And when it rips in two uh, by itself uh, at the death of Jesus, not only is it saying something theologically about open access to God, uh, but it's something that, that had a very dramatic, must have had a very dramatic impact on everybody who was watching and those whom they told about it. Um, a event that really overturns, that, that, that makes us think again about why it was there uh, and that both destroys and opens new opportunities at the same time.
Espagne.